it was a thing where I didn't want to end up out there on Figueroa again. I, I didn't want to end up, you know, watching another person being dragged out of the house, you know, and drugged to the alley because they had overdosed and people didn't want to stop and put their drugs down to call the police. Didn't nobody want to leave, you know? And these are the things that I saw, you know? I seen people set on fire, you know? And, you know, I just didn't want to live that life anymore. I seen drive-bys. I seen women needlessly just physically abused. I mean, I was physically abused needlessly, you know, and these are the things that I took myself through, you know, and I, I didn't want to have to go through that again. It's, I kept that right in front of me, and I remember it on a daily basis, you know, when these little things start working on me about, well, it sure would be nice to just go get one, you know. This is The Bottom Line. I'm Gary Thiemann in Los Angeles. Just a few harmless sips of champagne at a family gathering wouldn't be a big deal to most families. Unless, of course, one member happened to be prone to alcoholism. This is a story of experience, strength, and hope. Here's Janice's story. My name is Janice, and I'm an alcoholic. I was born in Los Angeles. Uh, July the 17th, 1964. From what I can remember as a young child, I always felt uh, less than or like I didn't fit in. I was raised by my grandparents and my aunt um, because my parents were very young when they had me, well, my mother. And therefore, you know, she wasn't very a very responsible person. So my grandparents and my aunt took on the challenge of raising me, and I might add, they did a, a great, they did a pretty good job. Um, I can remember from an early age, we always had big dinners, and a lot of people from the church would come over, and we always had big uh, Thanksgiving dinners, and the family would come over, and Christmas dinners. And uh, on these occasions, we would always have champagne. And I guess my grandparents and, you know, aunt didn't think that it was a big deal that I had a little bit of champagne, a sip or two here or there, uh, or, you know, at these dinners. But I can remember one time in particular when I was about seven or eight years old, I got this really warm feeling behind drinking the champagne and it kind of made me feel tingly and good inside, you know. And I, I got to running around the house, I can remember, and shaking my head from side to side and I just felt like I could just do a little bit of anything, you know, in the champagne. So what I proceeded to do was go around and uh, pick up people's cups when they weren't looking and, you know, drink their champagne. Well, not the whole cup, but enough to the point where they, you know, wouldn't notice it. But as I, as I noticed, people started to feel like I was feeling, then, it, you know, it got to the point where I really didn't care how, you know, after I had drank so much, I really didn't care how much of their drink I was drinking, so I just kept on drinking. And by the end of the evening, I was in the bathroom throwing up, holding the toilet seat, and, um, of course, my grandparents thought that it was just uh, I had eaten too much food, and this is what uh, I let them think. And my aunt used to keep beer and alcohol uh, for people in the house. Now, these were church-going people, so they, they never drank, you know, except for on these special occasions. But... I had friends and, you know, they were drinking and I was of peer pressure age and after going over to their house and experiencing drinking and, you know, just not enough to where when I got back home anybody would know about it, but just drinking and then wanting to go back over their house so that I could get that feeling again. I proceeded to go into the closet and start sneaking beers and drinking them in my room and hiding the bottles under my bed and, you know, turning the, the pack, the six pack in the other direction so when they opened the closet they wouldn't see that two were missing and, 
you know, then one day it just got to the point where I didn't care and I just took the whole six pack and I just figured, oh, uh, they, they probably forgot that it was even up here, you know, and my aunt, she had alcohol upstairs, so I never really was much for going up to her house, but when I found out she had alcohol, that was the place to be. So I would go up there and what I would do is I'd tell her that I was going to clean up her place while she was gone and she'd leave and go take care of her business, whatever it was she had to do, uh, to the bank or grocery store or whatever. And while she was gone, I'd go and pour me, pour me a whole glass of alcohol and proceed to fill her bottles back up with uh, water. Now this was very easy to do, especially with the brown bottles or the green bottles because she could never tell, you know, she could never really tell. And then, like I said, these weren't drinking people. So it wasn't like she was going to go and pour some alcohol as soon as she walked back in the house and said, Janice, there's water in here. But I do remember on an occasion, she did have some people over and she poured some, <laughs> she poured some alcohol for a couple of people. And there was basically nothing but water in these bottles. And I think that was the at the point where they started kind of, kind of starting to wonder. They didn't pinpoint it, but they started kind of wondering, you know, and it was always so much easier on me because we had other people, you know, like my father and other people that drank. So it was almost, it was easier for her to point the finger at them than to put it on me. You know, of course not me. I wouldn't do anything like that. So as I got a little bit older and this progressed, it went from alcohol to um, smoking cigarettes, and then from smoking cigarettes to smoking weed. And this, I should say, I was about uh, 11 or 12. And I guess you could say my first drink was when I was about eight years old, between seven and eight, somewhere in there. And I really liked the way it made me feel. But as I was saying, it just got progressively worse and I went from from weed to to more alcohol and a bigger quantities of alcohol I mean by the time I was 13 I was drinking 40 ounces and smoking a dime bag of weed and I was I was the type of child that was overly developed so at like 14 and 15 I was getting into spots that where you were eight, required to be 18 and older and um, had a little bit of fake ID and a little bit of makeup and my hair down, I had no problem. And I was always mature than the girls that were my age, so I never wanted to hang out with them. And I guess I just felt different from them. I just wanted to be older and I wanted to fit in. And with the girls that were older than I was, I felt like I could fit in because they were doing the things that I wanted to do. The girls that were my age, I didn't want to do the things that they were doing, you know. They, they were going to malls and hanging out with the little boys down the street and that just didn't interest me. It, what interests me was excitement, dangerous living, you know, drugs and alcohol. That's what excited me and that's what I got into. And progressively, it just got worse and worse. I went from, uh, at the age of 13, 40 ounces in a dime bag of weed to 15 and 16 snorting cocaine and, and doing mollies. I, I remember I graduated from high school at the age of 15. I, was, I, was, uh, I graduated a year early because I went to parochial school during the time living with my grandparents. And while I was in high school, I was selling mollies and taking my, I was popping five and six mollies a day. I was going to sleep on them. I was eating on them and I was, you know, snorting cocaine. I mean, just to the point where my nose would be just so froze. I didn't know it was on my face. My, my sinus cavities, I couldn't even feel them. I could not, I could put my hands on my cheeks and I could not feel my cheeks. You know, it just except for knowing that my fingers were there, that that was it, you know. It got to a point once where I could barely close my eyes because I had just, you know, done so much coke. And uh, from that point, uh, it still got worse. You know, I went into acid and uh, then I wanted to live the dangerous life, you know, of 
coming in at three and four o'clock in the morning. I got really rebellious. I ran away from home and went to live with my aunt who was, you know, a drug addict. And um, I just kind of like, I just love the excitement. You know, I just had to have drama going on in my life. It was just a necessity. And I, I love the action that went along with it. And um, from that point, I think that um, I felt there was nothing that really I couldn't do. Uh, I used to ditch school and I, I, I'd uh, smoke PCP. And I remember one experience of smoking PCP and going from one room to the next room and not even knowing how I got there. I remember I ditched school one day and we went to the beach and I was smoking angel dust and I was just whistling, walking right on out into the ocean, fully dressed, and some friends pulled me back out of the water. You know, I was on my way to killing myself and didn't even know it, you know, didn't even know it. And that's just how out of control I was. And uh, I, I mean, there are a few drugs that I did not use, but I was just a garbage can addict, you know. Whatever you had, I wanted to try it, you know, and I didn't feel like there was any reason why I couldn't try it. And if I liked it, I would keep doing it. I'd try it a second time and I'd keep doing it, you know. And uh, But it turned out to be that alcohol and cocaine end up, ended up being my real drugs of choice. But I say alcohol because before I will go to the dope house and buy drugs, I'll go to the liquor store first and get alcohol because I like, you know, go down. I like that feeling of going down. And then when I start feeling like I'm about to get out of control and I don't like to be on drugs that have me totally just out of control where I can't be in control of what's going on around me. Uh, I'd go and get some cocaine so that I could come back up and be fully aware of what was going on around me, you know. But eventually that played out too because then paranoia sets in and not even alcohol uh, can, you know, bring you down from that paranoia stage, you know, especially after you've been up for like two and three days, four or five days at a time. You start out on a Monday, and when you come to your senses, it's like Saturday. And you know, it's like a dream world. You wonder where you've been or what you've been doing. And, and you know, uh, it just got wild. You know, it, it, it took me down. It took me, it took me so far as to Figueroa, which is, uh, a stroll, what they call here in LA, where the prostitutes hang out. And um, I wouldn't go and hang out with the prostitutes because I knew as soon as they turned a trick, you know, and I was befriended them that I would, you know, get my propers too. And uh, this is what I proceeded to do. Only, you can only befriend somebody for so long before, you know, they consider you a freeloader. So, you know, I had to start pulling my end of the load too. And I'd like to be able to say that, you know, I've never slept with anybody for drugs, but I can't sit here and tell that because, you know, I, I, I have and I did. And I'm, it's not something that I'm proud of, but it just went along with the territory because like I said, I, I was into that excitement. I, I really liked that dangerous life, you know, and there were certain aspects of it I didn't like, and that was one of the aspects I didn't like, but I liked getting the drug, you know, and it wasn't so much that, you know, people would bring the drug to you or it would be there. Somehow I think the excitement came in the chase, you know, the chase of getting the drug. Um, I guess it's like with uh, a heroin user, you know, it's, it's not so much just the fact of uh, shooting the heroin, it's just the fact of fixing the needle and, 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 and spooning it up and the whole process that goes along with it. You know, you're attracted to it and you, you get used to doing it. So. Basically, that, that is where my drug usage took me, and it took me all the way down. I can remember starting out at uh, maybe 100 and, 
35, 40 pounds and being like 124 when I came off the streets and looking like a sunken skeleton because that's who I was and that's what I was. And I didn't think anything was wrong with me. You couldn't tell me there was anything wrong with me. I thought I looked perfectly fine. There are many different roads to recovery. For Janice, she calls it the Thorazine Shuffle. That's a hospital treatment program that gave her the tools necessary for the start of her recovery. Two days after I was rescued off of Figueroa, uh, my mother came and got me. Uh, I, t I called her and I told her I was tired. And for once, she didn't argue with me. She just came and got me. And I went to her house and I laid on her couch and I was sick as a dog and I was sweating and I was throwing up and I was detoxing. That's what I was doing. I was, I was just a mess. You know, I felt like my head was just gonna split open at any time. Every part of my body ached. I was just racked with pain. And somewhere in between those two days, I got so sick until I couldn't get up and leave from one room, which was only like about five to 10 feet to go to the restroom without getting dizzy. I would have to hold on to the walls just to get to the bathroom. I couldn't keep anything on my stomach. I couldn't even drink liquids. I mean, getting some water down was a job. I couldn't keep aspirin in my stomach. I couldn't do anything. So she took me to the hospital and I went to the VA hospital in uh, Brentwood and at that time they knew immediately when I got there I had a drug problem. I mean you could see I had a drug problem a mile away, you know, you could, <laughs> it was no problem to see that I had a drug problem. And so they suggested that I take a psych evaluation and so that they could put me into their program that they have. Now, I must be a sick individual because they didn't send me. Now, there's one side of the hospital where they treat you for illnesses of the body and so forth and so on, and that's the part where the hospital sits. But then there's the other part where they have people behind locked doors and people doing the Thorazine shuffle. And that's where they sent me, you know. And so I have a, a serious mental problem at the same time, obviously, because uh, I didn't get a chance to go to the Betty Ford Clinic. They sent me over to the insane part of Wadsworth, you know. And the program that I was in, um, I wasn't on lockdown or anything of that sort. I was able to move freely across the grounds, but it was a somewhat intensive program for 30 days. And some people require a little bit more, but um, for me, it was enough. For me, it was enough for me to get in touch with where my sickness really lied, and, and that was inside of my head. I wouldn't wish what I went through on anyone, not even my worst enemy. I wouldn't wish it on them. But some people have to go through what they have to go through. And I realize that today. And I believe that God never turned his back on me. I believe that I turned my back on him. But there's a little prayer and a, a poem that called footsteps and I truly do believe that the time that I was out there walking the streets and doing the things that I was doing he was carrying me
been listening to The Bottom Line featuring Janice's story. Janice, what a beautiful story. Thanks so much for sharing your experience, strength, and hope. This show is produced for Armed Forces Radio. I'm Gary Thieman. Until next time, God bless you and share the message, won't you? This has been a GRT production.